hello everyone uh, welcome to uh, this session of uh, the march meetings my name is iftikhar dadi and i'm an artist and a professor of art history at cornell university uh, before we begin i want to uh, thank hur al qasimi salah hassan and all the members of the Sharjah Art Foundation team for this remarkable and rich series of talks and discussions for the 2021 March meetings. Um, uh, this session looks at uh, 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 new research on uh, modernism and modern art in Asia and Africa. Um, so just to give a brief uh, sort of overview of the, of the landscape, uh, Asia and Africa have experienced uh, uneven decolonization, much of it since the mid 20th century onwards, and institutional and intellectual um, uh, developments that are related. Uh, the rise of modern art practices was associated with the withdrawal of colonialism and the consolidation of nationalism, the founding of institutions such as art schools and the museum, and artists' relationship to other regions via travel and movement of ideas, publications, and exhibitions. Seeing developments in this region only as national art history sometimes obscures their analysis in a comparative framework. Uh, by contrast, new scholarship emphasizes a connected and comparative approach from sites across the region to better understand both common and shared developments, as well as divergent trajectories. Art history research um, and writing is challenging in many of these locations due to lack of organized archives, poor state of libraries, lack of university departments, and the absence of uh, prior scholarship and mentoring. Comparative work is also essential for to investigate parallel and shared developments. The rise of modern art and its relay into the contemporary can be understood to reference cultural production that is experimental and reflexive, inhabits new pedagogic patronage and institutional arrangements, seeks new audiences and venues, and is generally concerned with exploring the predicament of the subject in modernity by drawing on fragments of archival and lived traditions. The effects of exchanges between artists and communities living and working across the world on the local itself are profound. These specific studies in turn benefit from shared methodological frameworks and studies from other sites. Um, common questions include the varying impact of uh, and the legacy of colonialisms, the founding of modern art institutions, art schools, museums, exhibition venues, the role of magazines, journals, and criticism in creating new publics, the place of tradition and crafts in and against modern art, resonance and tension between national and transnational developments, the importance of decolonization and as an aspiration and reality, the relation between artistic form and social transformation, and links between home and diaspora. Um, and. Uh, because this um, March meeting is in, in preparation for the for, for, for the Sharjah Biennial, which uh, which uh, looks at Oakley and Vizor's vision, I also wanted to hear uh, say a few remarks about Oakley and Vizor's project, specifically concerning modernism. Um, so, in uh, with, with the wake of kind of globalization of the art world in in, in the contemporary. Uh, times that we are living in. Other curators are also beginning to grapple with art as a global practice in the wake of 1989. But I think what I want to emphasize uh, that Envisor's uh, projects also excavated the deeper lineages of modern art and decolonization since the early and middle decades of the 20th century. So this is uh, so, so along with his, you know, kind of uh, abiding interest in contemporary projects, he's also in his projects looking backward and uh, thinking about modernism itself as uh, in, 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 in global frameworks. Um, uh, of the projects that he curated that and uh, you know that tackle modernism is uh, among them is the short century independence and liberation movements of Africa 1945 through 1994, which was foundational for me and which I saw in at MoMA PS1 in 2002. Um, the show and its accompanying publication vividly exemplified the tremendous creative and institutional energies unleashed by decolonization in Africa. 
the exhibition was strikingly multifaceted, encompassing art, publications, architecture, as well as political and institutional developments. And there is a very important publication that goes along with it. And uh, his more his his one of his last exhibitions was, of course, the in 2017 at uh, at Munich's Haus der Kunst, which is post-war art between the Pacific and the Atlantic, 1945 through 1965 which in some ways for me returns to the insights of the short century, but restages them on a fully global kind of level, uh, uh, dissolving hierarchies between and distinctions between the West and the quote unquote, the West and the non-West. Characteristically, Envisor prepared the ground for this exhibition by convening a four day conference, uh, producing a, and producing a series of publications along with the uh, uh, with the exhibition. And in this project, we encounter a generous landscape, both familiar and new, but which is above all premised on the recognition that modern art everywhere had advanced through complex relays of exchange and movements. Um, so with this brief intro introduction, I will now introduce the, uh, the panels. Uh, so we will begin with short presentations by in the order by Elizabeth Georges, Alex Siegerman, and Sadia Shirazi. This will be followed by discussion and a Q&A session. Uh, if um, I may remind the audience that they can um, uh, uh, share questions via the online eventive chat function throughout the session. And the final 15 minutes will be dedicated to the Q&A, depending on how we proceed. <laughs> And uh, um, we have a lot of ground to cover, and we'll try to get as many questions uh, to as many questions as possible, but we'll have need, may need to prioritize those that are most relevant to uh, uh, um, Also, uh, please keep in mind that uh, there is an Arabic interpretation and that the audience can select the language in the box on the right side of the screen. Um, OK. Um, so now let me introduce our three speakers. Um, our first speaker is Elizabeth Georges, who is an associate professor of art history, criticism and theory in the College of Performing and Visual Art and the Center of African and Asian Studies at University of Addis Abeba. She previously served as director of Modern Art Museum, Gebre Christos Desta Center, Dean of the College of Performing and visual art and director of the Institute of Ethiopian Studies at Addis Ababa University. She has curated several exhibitions at the Modern Art Museum, including Julie Mehrtu, The Addis Show in 2016, Time Sensitive Activity um, in 2015, and Addis Ababa, The Enigma of the New and the Modern in 2013. Her publications include uh, her book, Modern, Modernist Art in Ethiopia, uh, from 2019, Sukandar Bogosian, a brief introduction to the man and his and the artist in 2017, and Unheard Voices, contestations over representations for a collaborative project between SOAS and University of Addis Ababa from 2016. Um, she's a member of the editorial board of North e East African Studies and the Ethiopian General of Social Sciences and an advisory member to many other uh, 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 scholarly bodies. She received her PhD from Cornell University in 2010 and her MA in Museum Studies from New York University in 2003. Our next speaker is Alex Siegerman, who investigates the intersection of Islam and modernism in art history, including archival research on modern Middle Eastern art movements as well as an examination of how Islamic art history is a product of the modern era. She's assistant professor of Islamic art history at Rutgers University in Newark um, in the US. Her book, Modernism on the Nile, Art in Egypt between the Islamic and the Contemporary from 2019, traces the arc of Egyptian modernism in art, arguing that artists confronted and visualized the transnational context of their circulation. Um, she has published a number of articles, including Mahmoud Mukhtar, the first sculptor from the land of sculpture, this is from 2014, and Al-Tatawur, Evolution and Enhanced Timeline of Egyptian Surrealism from 2013. Her research contributes to the growing field of global modernism's diversifying 
narratives of 20th century art. And our final speaker is Sadia Shirazi, um, whose research focuses on trans regional histories of modernism and contemporary art across South Asia, the Middle East, and the diasporas, with a particular interest in questions of race, gender, post-coloniality, and decolonization. Uh, Shirazi has curated exhibitions internationally, including Soft and Wet at the Elizabeth Foundation Project Space in New York in 2019, and Welcome to What We Took from the State at the Queens Museum in 2016. Uh, her work has been shown at the 16th Venice Architecture Biennial, Performance Space New York, and the Devi Art Foundation in India. Uh, she has, uh, her writings and interviews have been published in various uh, platforms, including Art Forum, Bidun, MoMA Post, C Magazine, among others. And she has forthcoming articles in the journals Panorama, Journal of the Association of the Historians of American Art, and the Journal of Curatorial Studies. Um, Shirazi holds a Master of Architecture from MIT and is currently completing her PhD in, at Cornell University. Um, so uh, with this introduction, I will now hand over uh, to Elizabeth to begin her presentation. Okay, thank you, Iftikhar. Uh, currently, I'm uh, the Ali Majrui Senior Fellow here at the Sharjah Africa Institute in Sharjah, and it's a pleasure to work with the people in Sharjah, particularly with this, in this, in, with this March meeting. I would like to thank everyone, Pur al Kasimi, Salah Hassan, Wasan, Noura, Alia, Sana, I know I forgot a lot of people, but it's really a pleasure to work uh, here in Sharjah and with wonderful people like that. So I'll be talking about my book, Modernist Art in Ethiopia, that's based on Ethiopian modernism, and that approached the research and study of modernism from a different perspective than was previously written. Here, I'd like to say too, my, my, uh, my book is really shaped and formed by my training at Cornell and particularly by my professors, Iftikhar Dadi, Salah Hassan, and Hujan Bakmore. So that needs to be credited. I need to give the proper credit to, for my training and to think of modernism in a different way. So uh, through my book, though my book theorizes uh, Ethiopia through a range of uh, critical uh, cultural and political positions uh, that's context specific, I would also like to think that it also broadly serves on reconceptualizing Africa as a theoretical category to examine the contemporary moment. So when I thought about Ethiopian modernism, I first reflected on the application and meaning of decolonization that occurred globally after the Second World War and its mark on the Ethiopian political and cultural context, in addition to the broader experiences of decolonization at the present time. So I argued it was the multiplicities of rupture and continuity, both in creative enterprises and social political conditions that shaped modern Ethiopian art history. And here I'd like to say that the term decolonization that's excessively used in contemporary scholarship in an almost fashionable way should be problematized as well. Indeed, ideas around decolonization emerge from social movements. And it is these movements that we need to critically theorize since they have multiple histories and contexts that give meaning to the present. So, and not much of these movements emerge in contemporary writings, but rather broad theorizations of such movements that I, argue ultimately re will reduce the genesis and evolution of these social movements. So having said this, I would also like to emphasize the complexities that arise when one attempts to understand specific colonial histories. In this case, the relationship of Ethiopia to the history of colonization and decolonization due to the country's specific colonial history. Ethiopia had never been colonized except for a brief occupation by fascist Italy from 1936 to 41. So although some say that this occupation amounts to colonialism. I would like to take the conventional Ethiopian line that the country was briefly occupied rather than colonized since this line conveys the complexities and complications that incited the range of Ethiopian modernism. Moreover, when the larger population continues to brag about escaping the colonial experience and that their history is devoid from the colonial history of Africa, unpacking this imaginary, however challenging, uh, becomes uh, imperative. So they, uh, this perspective in some of its central positions be, has historically reduced the significance of the colonial myth and ideology, uh, significantly so in the vast literatures uh, 
that shape the studies of Ethiopia, its culture, history, and aesthetic imagining as fields of study had glaring emissions of such knowledge in academic inquiry and in the wider uh, intellectual uh, thought. So this demonstrates the extent of anti-colonial thinking and knowledge production. And it's precisely this disjuncture that in fact, and that I argue characterizes Ethiopian modernism, accounting for the peculiarity of the various intellectual uh, and artistic currents that I cover. So one central question is thus the following, can a sensibility of decolonization emerge in such an imaginary? Here, I also want to clarify what I mean by decolonization besides the its impact of civil rights and black struggles on the minds of the ones colonized, it's also the psychological and political effects of oppression and dehumanization that's still relevant to consideration. Decolonization is also the, the possibility to realize the role of human agency and it's moved to decenter colonial uh, hierarchies that have continued to be with Africa uh, since independence. Uh, so today the theories of uh, decolonization or the voices of decolonization are not really uh, contained in uh, academic institutions, but are outside of the institutions uh, uh, that I cover in the last chapter of, uh, of the book, for example, contemporary artists addressing the challenges of neoliberal imposition, such as space and urbanization that has uh, displaced multitudes of subjects to the peripheries of destitution. So, uh, so it's equally important to theorize these alternative uh, spaces. So it's in this regard, that uh, I argue in the last chapter that um, uh, Ethiopian artists and other humanists currently produce decolonial aesthetic. But as I've indicated, how do these artists and humanists understand colonialism and its legacy in Ethiopia and in the larger continent within a discourse of exceptionalism that is per pervasive in academic inquiry and the wider intellectual thought? And when we say decolonial aesthetic, does this simply premise an understanding of colonial history or legacy? And if so, what kind of colonial history or legacy? How do contemporary Ethiopian artists and humanists themselves perceive exclusion? How do they conceive their modernism? And what is their perception of colonial or capitalist modernity? So can a contemporary decolonial aesthetic simply exist as a site of resistance without presuming a history of colonialism and its legacy? as is the case in the works of Ethiopian contemporary artists. And if modernism initially came to Africa through colonial contact, and modern art extensively developed during the early period of decolonization, what does Ethiopia's unique historical condition, uh, its independence for five years, uh, extend to the theoretical uh, uh, purview of modernity and modernism, which have sig gra grounded signification in wider, um, constellations of colonial consciousness. So clearly the unique dimensions of Ethiopian visual and intellectual thought have significant consequences in how I theorize modernism and decoloniality. So while I argue non-colonized Ethiopia's supposed singularity cannot be conceived outside the broader colonial legacy, I also attempt to understand modernism through the dogmas that has framed the studies of Ethiopia that have completely cast aside the colonial uh, legacy. But the challenges to historicize this required multiple uh, and varied uh, interrogations. You know, I don't want to go into uh, Ethiopia's history too. They, you know, dates back to the fourth century AD, AD and its uh, its imagination in the African diaspora. And uh, but after the 1983 famine, what's ultimately ironic is not so much Ethiopia's indifference to the black imagination, but the textures of indigence that has eclipsed, eclipsed the country in the 21st century. And that more ironic still muffled Ethiopia's name in black politics and imaginary. So it's the material epistemological and spiritual forms of an exceptionalist imaginary and its reflection on the production of the visual arts that I had attempted to study. So I looked at texts and practices outside of the canon, like newspaper reportage, popular culture and their occasioning, as well as novels, poems and songs beginning in the 1900s, when the urge to modernize the country came into the fore, and how intellectuals uh, and cultural producers and subaltern actors understood modernization and the politics of modernity, and particularly how they deliberated on sovereignty and modernity when every country surrounding the border of Ethiopia was under colonial rule. Kenya, Egypt, Sudan, uh, et cetera. So 
Uh, of course, you know, formalist analysis is necessary, but uh, it's, the, it's the critical consensus and interplay of visual and inter intellectual thought uh, that I espoused uh, will bring a broader perspective uh, to modernism, genesis, uh, and evolution. Uh, so the newspaper reportage of early 1900 particularly shaped this query. I was interested in how intellectuals considered the constructed divide between the West and the non-West and how they perceived such divisions. My method of reading and interpretation honed on subtle nuances, desires, like the desire to consume modern things and popular perceptions of what it means to be modern. Image, uh, Western, please. Image one, there is uh, advertisement images here. So this is an advertise. this is, uh, this is, this is the newspaper, the, in the newspaper, you know, this is an AP Marciano fiat that you should pursue in the early 1900s, uh, an advertisement that was recurring in the newspaper. Next uh, was, yeah, this is a, a, an advertisement for cognac. You know, don't drink local drinks. It's not good for you, but you should drink cognac. It's very refined. It's very European. It makes you sophisticated. Next, uh, next one. This is the same thing, a cognac. So, and I'll go back to other images later, but, um, so the intellectual's engagement with modernization was rooted in a genuine hope that progress and development could be extracted from the monopoly of the West and that Ethiopia could become an equal participant in the community of the modern world. The fear of colonial occupation around the border particularly exacerbated the anxiety to, uh, to modernize. So to, uh, yeah, to, to modernize. So, and perhaps the most interesting aspect of the writings was the imagination of the nation that was replete with exceptionalism. They reduced sentiments of otherness, even as they exacerbated a perennial anxiety about otherness. So a major theme for early 20th century artists and intellectuals. So the nation was approached as an abstract and sublime uh, idea. So that's also when I argue modernism came into the core, when artistic production radically shifted from previous practices of church art. And beyond that, new ideas and imaginations also affected different areas of artistic sub subjectivity and inquiry. So the next image, paint. So paintings of multi-scene images, heroic battle scenes. This is uh, uh, the heroic battle scene on the Battle of Adwa, uh, made by an artist called Alec Alucas, uh, were primarily sold to the foreign market. Similar to religious paintings, these works generally renounce the European perspective and the illusion of volume and depth. The figures they depicted are arranged on flat surfaces and typically shown in static poses with unnatural head and body proportions. The next one, uh, please. The second is Balacho Yimers. Uh, I, I consider him the first modernist of the Balacho Yimers Battle of Adwa painting. Uh, so my argument is that this body of work demarcated a newfound consciousness in aesthetic practice. Artistic practice grew paradoxically with a European colonial imaginary that enthusiastically embraced embrace this genre of artworks, not necessarily out of regard for their quality, but as objects of curiosity. These works lacked the familiar features of European, uh, European form formalist traditions, but their classification should closely attend to material details, unique symbols and images in the composition. So there can be little doubt that these renditions were credible expressions of modern desires. Artists embrace the tradition and values of the Orthodox Church, not as irreconcilably opposite, but as part and parcel of modern subjectivity. Uh, so, so for example, here in this image, you can see the Ethiopian army. So half-faced figures are, are evil spirits and full-faced figures are the good ones. So here you see Ethiopian soldiers in half-faced in half positions battling the Italian army without even looking at the Italian army. You know, they're like this and they're shooting down. So that was comical for, for, uh, for foreigners who thought it was really cartoonish type of thing. So for me, but these two histories, that of European modernism and that of its other have always intersected. That was, and it's this traverse that is interesting to understand because a lot of foreigners were coming after the Battle of Adwa. Uh, kind of a secular painting evolved. Uh, during this time. This is the, these are the types of secular paintings that evolved. So, but one cannot compare 20th century art to European formal elements from its own period, although deciphering the formal properties of these types of work is essential because uh, such description will preserve the authenticity of uh, the work. So like I said, 
They were curiosity objects and refer to, uh, Europeans refer to them as comical, cartoonish. Uh, for instance, this particular uh, painting of the Battle of Adwa shows the Ethiopian army, like they said, with their facial features fully visible. They are seen slaying the enemy in full force, but they're directly confronting and leaning into the viewer's gaze rather than looking at the enemy they're battling. So this type of depiction, depiction like I said, amused many Europeans who wrote about the comical nature of these paintings. Yet for me, the artist wanted to portray the dreadful nature of the enemy through the symbolic attributes of his culture. And precisely because of these sensitivities, it's most important to read these paintings in their inimitability and against conventional uh, Western views. So by the 1960s, a complicated perception of the nation would emerge in intellectual thought uh, and artistic practice, a period I call the prime of modernism, without doubt was the most important historical period that fundamentally changed the course of modern Ethiopian history. Uh, the period's intellectual, aesthetic, and political consequences continue to legitimate the spaces of knowledge production. And any study of the movements of decolonization in the 60s naturally entail, entails, among other things, the beginning of competing ideologies of the colonial past in wider constellations of colonial consciousness uh, and uh, relations. So, uh, regarding the politics of exploitation, rights, and exclusions, intellectuals focused on a Marxist Leninist understanding of the peasant la landlord relationship to claim Ethiopia was encumbered by an imperial feudal structure distinct from the colonial arrangement imposed on other African countries. In other words, there was a struggle between classes rather than between colonizer and colonized. Still, Addis Ababa was the hub for, for African anti-colonial uh, struggle. The OAU was established in 1963. So uh, a, a vibrant artistic culture emerged, although devoid of the colonial myth and ideology again. Uh, so image three, please. So I'm, I'm gonna show you four images, the, the Ethiopian modernists that emerged in the 1960s. Uh, Skinder Bogosian, this is Juju's wedding. Uh, that's a collection at the Modern Art Museum. He, he, uh, he did this while he was in Addis Ababa. So Skinder was, Skinder was different from the, art, the other artists of the period in that he was, he was in France during the anti-colonial and independence movements. He was in 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 in, in, in relation. I mean, he related. He was in with uh, the Senghors of the me with their fr his friends were um, uh, Senghor, Messager, and all these people. Actually, Messager did a, uh, had a poetry in the 1960s in the 1960s about Ethiopia. So Iskander's paintings were totally different than uh, the other painters uh, during this period. So Iskander incorporated ancestral spirits, you know, the African ancestral spirits uh, into, you know, juxtaposed Af African ancestral spirits into uh, modern um, composition. So uh, the next one, please. Uh, that's Skinder II, uh, this a collection at the North Carolina Art Museum. Juju, it's about the Juju too, the Juju is the ancestral spirit, Juju's flight and, of night and delight, this is called. It's, uh, so it's 1963, made in 1963 in Paris. Uh, next, please, uh, Gavra Christos Desta, another modernist of the period, Golgotha. This is one of his iconic paintings that at the Modern Art Museum now. Uh, but you know, it's a painting of the crucifix. You know, he's uh, challenging Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Church crucifix de depiction. The Orthodox Church does not. Um, deploy a crucifix that's bloodied, you know? So Gavra Christos Desta was challenging the Orthodox myth and the Ethiopian Orthodox, uh, you know, just to sum it up, it's, it's, you can, we can narrate a long story around that, but uh, challenging the Christian myth and ideology. The next one, mm, next. Okay, this is Gavra Christos Desta self-portrait. I just wanted to, to show you uh, how fantastic of a painter he was. He, this is a self-portrait owned by a uh, uh, private collector now. Uh, so these artists, I mean, there were many other artists, but these artists were the, 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 the front runners of uh, the 1960s uh, modernism. Uh, still challenging the imperial ideology, the imperial state, but at the same time, uh, except for Iskander maybe, but at the same time, devoid of, uh, uh, depicting uh, you know, the effects of colonialism like other artists of the 1960s did. So uh, 
So artists had barely begun, I'm just rushing to, to finish in, the, in this 20 minutes. So artists had barely begun to deliberate on the conceptual materials of Ethiopian modernism when socialism declared modern art bourgeois and decadent. Crucially as well, the fine art school, which was established in 1957 by Ankara Haile Selassie and whose intellectuals of the 1960s keenly responded at least to injustice and inequality, ultimately bent to the political uh, pressures of tyranny for 17 years. So after the revolution of 1974 that ousted the monarchy, the fine art school had also revised its curriculum to socialist ideas. Students were required to work only from the following list and choices from the top of this list were encouraged. Uh, so the list was as follows. Glorification of the proletarian struggle and its achievements, patriotism and heroes of the revolution and the military defending the motherland, socialist farmers engaged in communal work, the equality of women and women at work or as mothers, humanity defined by work and depictions of people at work, and five historical heroes and martyrs uh, of the people in an anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist struggle. So in order to explore how issues of nationalism, history, memory, and identity were produced and employed by artists, I focus my examination on artistic practices that were elusively articulated outside the prescriptive identity of propaganda aesthetics. So, so there were some propaganda aesthetics, and before I get into that, can you do the next image, uh, Wasim? Okay, so before I get into that, I would like to uh, show you the art of famine, which was a very powerful depiction of famine that was uh, uh, done between the 1973 famine and 1983. This is one of uh, the earlier paintings depicting the 1973 famine. This is a Chateau Turuna, uh, who called uh, who's the victims of famine, it's called. Uh, next. Um, okay, this is Gabra Kistos the, the, the painter I showed you earlier, the modernist, the 1960 modernist who uh, who represent, I mean, who, who was representing, I mean, who was depicting the famine of the 1983 famine. Uh, this is a very, very graphic description of the, uh, of the famine with haunted bodies and, you know, um, a mother Ethiopia holding here, mother Ethiopia holding a, a skeleton uh, in her arms. Uh, so I just wanted to portray uh, the paintings of famine that came around that time during the socialist between, the, between 1973 and 1983. Next, please. Famine again. This is one of my favorite uh, famine paintings. It's uh, an artist called Bakala Haile, uh, who does not really, who, uh, yeah, it's an artist called Bakala Haile. So these are two famished children uh, in front of um, the monument of, um, it's called the Yakati Tashraulot monument where uh, Rodolfo Graziani, the Italian uh, fascist had uh, massacred uh, about 30,000 people after an assassination attempt. So, you know, that's, that's a monument. So the monument is uh, amplifies freedom, right? So uh, it's based, I mean, it's sort of the composition is around the monument and uh, uh, the famine victims around that time. And you see a revolution here, around here, a revolutionary. That was, that was when the armed struggle had started to a guerrilla warfare and ar an armed struggle, I mean, a revolutionary uh, guerrilla war warrior fleeing that space to go uh, fight for, uh, for independence. So next, please. Okay, so these, are, these were the propaganda aesthetics that were uh, artists were forced to produce uh, uh, during that time. This is called Enamert, let's, let's, uh, let's develop let's, uh, with communism. Uh, Mother Ethiopia is blowing her horns, uh, you know, mobilizing her children to come through to the, to come to the revolution. Next, please. Okay, so this is, uh, this is mother, revolutionary motherland or death. So mother Ethiopia is holding the red flag, uh, uh, you know, inviting people to join the communist party of Ethiopia to, for, for, you know, independence, freedom and independence. Next. Next, okay. So this is another, uh, you know, revolutionary, uh, with, with the red flag. This is, these were propaganda aesthetics that were forced there in the collection in the School of Fine Arts and Design, forced by the state, students being forced to produce these paintings. So this is another revolutionary. Next. This is a graduation work of one of the teachers. He's a teacher now at the School of Fine Arts and Design, the graduation works of uh, Abba Kasai, uh, the hammer and sickle, uh, which is uh, in the collection of the Fine Arts and uh, Design. 
so these were the propaganda aesthetics that were for that students were forced to produce. But there were um, so, but but students also produced. I mean, they produced these when they were forced when they were forced to do it. But for uh, they did uh, other works besides this that really that didn't really depict the proletarian, but depicted. I mean depicted their own type of worker. That didn't really depict, uh, uh, you know, martyrs. Mar they, they will produce martyrs like Minilik, Emperor Minilik, going back to the Battle of Adwa, producing Emperor Minilik. So that will, uh, that, that, that satisfies the state's image, the state's uh, propaganda demand, as well as the artist saying, no, we're not going to succumb to your propaganda stupid ideal, but we will have our own type of uh, uh, our own type of articulation. So in the in the midst of the shock and disturbance produced by Ethiopia's move to socialism, many artists uh, and lit literary intellectuals, I argued, parodied, uh, parodied the propaganda stupid ideal of the state, while while at the same time longing uh, for Ethiopia uh, for Utopia itself. Uh, so it was also in the late 1970s that the Department of Ideology of the State began to publish several theoretical papers on the urgent and necessary relationship between art and ideology. For instance, in a section called Creativity in Pre-Revolutionary Ethiopia, the publication stated, in pre-revolutionary Ethiopia, art reflected the ideology of the feudal bourgeois reactionary class. Even with art's glorification of this particular class, the privilege given to art and artists by the feudal bourgeois class was not satisfactory. Furthermore, this class was a big stumbling block that hindered the growth of the creative art. So such types of publications were coming out constantly. Uh, so I focused on, there are no, there are no longer work, people tell you we don't have the works that we did in subversion of the state, subverting the state. We don't, we don't, we no longer have it, but so-and-so has it. It's in private collection only as so-and-so they don't have it. So I couldn't find any work that were really produced uh, in subversion to the state. So I focused on graduating student work that's, that's archived at the school. Uh, the regime wanted artists to portray its ideas as in the categories we examined early on, but student artists were disillusioned with the regime and they produced works that were repetitive, monotonous, and melancholic. So many paintings on canvas, uh, these artworks are exploited stereotypes, uh, legible pa patterns, and other rec uh, easily recognizable forms. So the images narrated, for example, the history of tyranny through kings and queens. Next, a uh, question? Uh, no, not this one. Previous one? Yeah, this one. Okay, so this is Emperor Menelik and his wife. Um, it's called uh, Minilik and, Minilik and Aitu, uh, done by a student artist. Uh, so his history of tyranny through kings and queens, this, these types of, of works were allowed, uh, or workers and peasants uh, through portraits of past valor and through visions of uh, grandeur and might. Uh, so next, next, okay, so this is a, a portrait of, uh, uh, a mythical guy called Geraiderus. Geraiderus supposedly slew an Italian fascist in Italy. He was imprisoned in Italy, in Rome, slew uh, an Italian uh, fascist in front of uh, uh, the king, Vittorio Emanuele. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a mythical, I mean, the, the history is very mythical, but everybody believes that he really did it. But uh, there was an article out uh, recently by uh, uh, what's his name? Anyway, by an Italian Ethiopianist who said he was imprisoned there, but uh, for other reasons, and he did not slew anybody, or he did not uh, slew an Italian fascist in front of uh, uh, the Italian king. So, but a yeah. mythical figure that was produced. Uh, so, Elizabeth, can you okay. please try to finish quickly now, huh? Because uh, okay, so I didn't yeah, cover a lot of stuff, but then let me tell, let me show you some images of uh, contemporary artists who work on. Um, uh, urbanism and uh, and urban through around urbanism. So can you do can you do the next image, Wesson? Okay. So this is a photography by Mikhail Agai, whose uh, work. Uh, this is a tombstone, a shattered tombstone. He works around cemeteries. The cemetery, some of the cemeteries, for example, are being. Uh, you know, they're, they're paving the way for road construction. So people are told to 
uh, take the remains out of their loved ones, the, the remains of their loved ones out of the cemetery. Some who have money bury them in uh, special in burial spaces. Others are just put in sacks and buried in mass graves. So he's, he's working on these tombstones and how shattered they are, particularly when trucks come to shatter it to, to shatter the 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 tombs the two the tombs themselves. Next. Okay, this is another one of that depiction. Next. Okay, this is another one of that depiction too. This is Michael Zagai, the artist photographer. This is a cover of my book. This is the same artist, uh, Michael Zagai, Mikhail Zagai. So he's looking at Addis Ababa, the, the wreck of Addis Ababa, uh, you know, through, you know, Addis Ababa is being massively transformed uh, for development projects. Uh, so this is, uh, what, this is what you see, the shanty hall, and then the high rise buildings right after, right next to each other. Next. So this is the same thing. So this goes quickly and, uh, and these are artists that are doing such specific works. You know, these are uh, for, from demolished homes, like doors and windows from demolished homes. So artists work around that, those sites uh, by doing all kinds of performative interventions in that. So this next, this is Burhan Washagra, an artist called Burhan Washagra. Next, this is the same thing that I brought into the museum at the Government Sister Star Center. Next. Okay, so this is, okay, you see the Samsung insignia. It's a, it's a, it's an avenue. You know, there's a lot of avenues now with road construction. So these avenues are, you know, it should be spaces for memorialization, but you know, it's an advertisement have been, uh, Advertisement like Samsung here, you see uh, Samsung advertisement on a square. So it's an artist posing as a master, you know, just parodying the, 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 the advertisement of Samsung. Next. This is, uh, okay, next, I'm not going to explain. Go ahead. Next, next. <laughs> Sorry. Next. Okay. So it's, it's the same artist, the Yogi Taba. So they're working, these are tin. Thin fences that cover all these demolished uh, sites. So artists are using these tin surfaces or tin fences. Uh, you know, these are faces that loom out. You know, displaced people, uh, the sex workers that have been displaced. Uh, so all kinds of portraits looming from these tin fences. Uh, an artist called Yom Kitaba, and I think the last one is David. Next, I think it's David Abel. No, this is the same artist. Okay, this is, this is a very important, this is Helen Jujaro, uh, she's called Helen Jujaro, performance artist. This, her, the, her mother's grave was demolished because of uh, road construction. So she performed in the same grave that her mother was removed, the day the mother was removed, the, the, the remains of the mother was removed. So it was really a very provocative and very uh, sad actually performance. So it's, it's, uh, I just wanted to show you that. Next. That's it's the same artist. And that's it, okay, so this is not relevant. I was gonna talk about this, but I'm done, okay. So that's, that's that was, um, it's, it's enough. Thank you, Iftakar. You're mute, you're mute, Iftakar, you're mute. Yeah, so thanks, a uh, lot to think about, uh, which I hope we'll come back in the, in the discussion, but uh, I want to now ask uh, Alex to please uh, do her presentation. Can you see it? Yes? Okay, great. Okay, so I just want to echo the thanks of my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you, Salah, for inviting me. Um, thank you to Sharjah Art Foundation and Horal Qasimi for hosting all of us. Uh, thank you, Iftikhar, for your comments. And to Elizabeth and Sadia for being co-presenters. I look forward to our conversation afterwards. And of course, Bosan Sana and the whole um, Charter Art Foundation team for organizing this today. I'm really delighted to be presenting here at the March meeting and um, something that has been really great over the last six months, um, nine months of all of these Zoom um, conferences and seminars is the ability to talk about global modernism and some of the most, you know, with people all over the world in ways that we probably wouldn't have done 
um, had had we not been all forced onto Zoom. So um, I am looking forward to our conversation afterwards. So today I'm going to be talking about my book, Modernism on the Nile, Art in Egypt Between the Islamic and the Contemporary, which was published in 2019. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I wrote this book. Um, and second, I will give a little bit of an overview of the content of the book, the first four chapters. Uh, which three of them focus on three major artists, Mahmoud Mokhtar, Mahmoud Saeed, and Abdelhadi El Ghazar, who are very famous and well-respected in Egypt. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, the main argument of the book. Um, I developed this term called constellational modernism. So I'll explain what I mean by that. And then um, I have some questions uh, that have come up from, as I said before, these other conversations around global modernism, um, and hopefully I, I took some notes from what Elizabeth was saying and what Iftihar mentioned in the beginning and um, hopefully some fodder for discussion afterwards um, with Saadi as well. Okay. So my book traces modernism in Egypt from the late 19th century into the mid 20th century. And it traces uh, three major artists, two painters and one sculptor, Mahmoud Mokhtar, Mahmoud Said, and Abdel Hadi El Ghazar, along with visual culture that um, in chapter five actually stretches back until the 18th century. And um, with this book, I reason I wrote this book was to make three interventions in three subfields of art history. So first of all, for modernist art history, I think as we are all doing, um, we're filling a gap in modern art history that has historically focused on Europe and North America, uh, refocusing attention on the non-traditional centers of modernist art production and um, complicating and diversifying and decolonizing, though I think Elizabeth is right, we need to really problematize how that word is being used, but um, moving out from those traditional centers of Paris and New York to talk about modernism as it developed in other places of the world. So this is a deep dive into the modern art movement in Egypt in order to um, complicate the primary story of modernism that is told in modernist art history in the um, mainly Euro-American academic context. It also, uh, my other reason that I wrote this book was to push Islamic art into the modern era. So most histories of Islamic art, textbooks, museum collections, um, undergraduate classes, they stop around 1800 with the onset of colonialism. Um, and so this book argues that we should very much consider the um, modern art of the Islamic world as part of this longer story of Islamic art. And in, in, in order to do so, I really argue that the role of religion is um, important in understanding Egyptian modernism, that these artists definitely reference um, there is the Islamic context that they're making, but they don't, they refuse to be defined by that. So that's an important point of the book and, and adds to how, how we can see this as part of that field of Islamic art history and pushing Islamic art history into the modern era. And third, what was really important for me with this book was not to just add to the story of modernism, um, just another, another kind of modernism in a different place, but really to change the terms with which we dis describe and define and talk about modernism. And so that is why I came up with this term, constellational modernism, which I am confident really defines um, what is going on in Egypt. Um, and I'm really curious and hopeful that this um, term could be used in other places as a way to develop more comparative models of studying modernism. So, um, and this is something we can talk about in the discussion section, but um, the ways in which we do our research um, as, as graduate students and as scholars is sometimes very much defined by um, national boundaries. And so this is a very nationalist project because I was not allowed to leave Egypt while I was doing my field work because I was on a fellowship there that um, prevented me from leaving the country. So um, hopefully, you know, as, as things change and um, as we take these projects into the future, we can start talking more about the ways in which they connect. So I'm hoping that this constellational modernism is one way we can do that. Okay, so just a little bit of a background 
um, on Egypt. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with um, the pharaonic past of Egypt. Um, but I just want to point out that Egypt has a lot of very rich art historical pasts. And one of the ways that I think um, a lot of global modernisms can be talked about comparatively is the ways in which heritage is used. And in Elizabeth's talk, she just mentioned some ways in which um, the Orthodox Christian um, painting styles and iconographies were challenged and appropriated into the modern era. And similarly, in Egypt, there is a use of these art historical pasts. So for the pharaonic past, ancient Egypt is definitely one of, one of the most important and recognizable, um, but just wanted to point out that there's also a Greco-Roman past, a Coptic past, um, and of course the Islamic past, which was, here we see Fatimid, Mamluk, and the Ottoman periods. So um, artists, when they are working in the 20th century, are drawing from a variety of different pasts and um, we can see that in their work. And I think one question for global modernism is how and why is that heritage deployed um, in, in their art? Because um, sort of the process of using heritage and deploying it is the thing, even if it's, if it's Coptic or uh, a Coptic past or an ancient Egyptian past or a Islamic past, the process of co-opting and deploying these heritage these references to heritage in the modern era sort of is the is the underlying link um, between between um, the artwork. Okay, so now I'm going to go through a brief overview of the first four chapters of the book. So in chapter one, I discuss the visual culture of 19th century Egypt, including photography, lithography, and also textual discourse. And I argue that these um, robust developments in um, popular culture, visual culture, and um, mainly works on paper led to the creation of a public for the visual arts that would become the audience of the art world in the 20th century. And most importantly, this audience was the receiver of the fine art school that opened in 1908. So a lot of local histories of modern Egyptian art start triumphantly with the founding of the Egyptian School of Fine Arts. It was originally called uh, Ecole Egyptienne de Beaux-Arts. The name was French um, in 1908, and um, it is still operating today as Colette Fnoun Gemila in the neighborhood of Zamalek. Um, went through many iterations and different name changes, but it is still uh, essentially the same school. Um, so pertinent um, to our discussion here, also I think um, coming off what Elizabeth was saying in terms of not just looking at the artworks, but also the discourse surrounding them. In 1904, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abdu, who is the Mufti of Al-Azhar, wrote an article in which he argued for the benefits of painting and sculpture, um, stating that the threat of idol worship was no longer applicable in the modern era. And so uh, this is sort of an important point that that um, art di discussion of art uh, was occurring through the Nahda, um, so that we can also see the modern fine arts movement in Egypt as part of a larger philosophical, theoretical, and theological movement of the Arab Renaissance called the Nahda that was prevalent throughout the Arabic speaking world at that time. Uh, in chapter two, I discuss the work of Mahmoud Mokhtar, uh, who is Egypt's most famous modern sculptor. And he made this nationalist public work in the 1920s. It's called Nahdat Mas, or Egypt's Reawakening. So first he made a small maquette of it in 1920, following the 1919 Egyptian revolution um, as a statement against the British occupation and in support of Egyptian self-rule. Uh, and then it would became so popular uh, in its small form that there they was a kind of a popular plan um, young young nationalist activists got behind the sculpture and there was a subscription campaign so sort of regular people from peasants to wealthy women donated to construct this sculpture and it was ultimately unveiled in 1928 outside of the train station and today it has since been moved outside Cairo University and I think as you can clearly see um, he is using that pharaonic past, pharaonism, which was prevalent across art and um, cultural production of the 1920s. Um, he, and he's also referencing the nationalist symbol of the Egyptian peasant. And this is also something that comes up a lot um, through uh, 
through uh, global modernism, the, the worker, the peasant, especially in anti-colonial um, movements, nationalist movements, and um, socialist movements. So here the peasant um, represents the fecundity of the Nile River and the agriculture that the Nile River has supported for, for millennia. But also, um, he is also participating in the return to order movement that was prevalent in Europe at this time. So after World War I, many European artists returned to classical Greco-Roman forms. You might think of Giorgio de Chirico as a prominent example of this. Um, and so Mahmoud Mokhtar is kind of has a has a toe in each in each pond, so to speak. He he has a a, a studio in Paris and a studio in Cairo. And he's participating, clearly participating in these nationalist movements and nationalist Im imagery in Egypt, but also participating in um, art movements uh, in Europe at the same time. And he has a um, he has a exhibition at Gallery Bernheim Jeune in Paris in 1930 that is very very well received. So it's interesting, Elizabeth. I noticed you know that that painting, the Battle of Adwa from 1935. You said that the European commentators were sort were very um, very disparaging of of that of that image. It sort of you know to compare these two things, uh, Mokhtar is very very well received in Paris. Um, so that's an interesting. I wonder why there's a sort of um, gap between the the reception European reception of those two artists who are kind of working at the same time. Okay. In chapter three, I discuss Mahmoud Said, who is uh, well known as Egypt's one of Egypt's most famous modern painters. He was from Alexandria, and he was really well known for his prowess in oil painting, as I think you can see from these two paintings. They're really just luxurious, and not only what they're depicting, but also the the tone and the and the type of oil painting. So, unlike Mokhtar, he was not a professional artist. This was not his. Um, how he made his, his living. He was from an elite land owning family. Um, his father was actually prime minister of Egypt very briefly in uh, 1914. And for most of his life, Mahmoud Said worked at the mixed courts in Alexandria as a lawyer. Um, the mixed courts were a really fascinating transnational uh, legal system that was established in the 19th century that led to the efflorescence of the city of Alexandria. So the mixed courts um, were you could have a contract enforced um, if different nationalities wanted to go in on a project together. Um, there was a difficulty in enforcing that contract without a legal system to, to do so. So the mixed courts, if you had a, an Italian builder, a Greek funder and an Egyptian owner, for instance, um, the mixed courts would allow that contract to be enforced, making it more economically uh, viable for all the parties. So um, he worked for this for this organization. And I look in this chapter to how that transnational legal system was reflected in his artwork. His luxurious canvases depict this upper class community that was represented at the mixed courts, as you can see on the left, his wife in a green shawl. Um, she's on this Italianate balustrade. That landscape behind her is absolutely not Egypt. Um, it looks like uh, Tuscany. He traveled widely in Europe. And um, they also had a house in Lebanon. So this looks like either Lebanon or, or Italy. Um, and he makes a stark contrast in his, in his oeuvre between these portraits of his upper class community and nudes um, of mostly lower class women who are of a clearly different uh, class, but also race. And so he makes a sharp racial distinction in the skin tones and the sexuality depicted between these two, two groups. Um, and I argue that this is his way in which he constructs his and his family's or his community's whiteness in opposition to um, the lower class, lower classes um, through these nude paintings of, of them. In chapter four, four I discuss Abdelhadi El Ghazar, who came of age during the era of um, revolution in Cairo. The Free Officers Revolution of 1952 ushered in the charismatic leader Gamal Abdel Nasser, 
and ultimately expelled the British occupation in 1956. So uh, Abdul Hadi Al-Ghazad has a post-surrealist style where he jettisons this pharaonic reference. So we don't see those pharaonic themes as much um, for references to Islam. So here he, in The Green Man, he's referencing Al-Khidr, the mystical figure from the Quran. Um, and he develops a more accessible style in order to reach the masses. And also this turn to Islam is, um, Islamic references is also a way in which to make a more accessible style to uh, the population in Egypt. So he's too young to be part of the art and freedom group, that surrealist group that is very well known from Egypt. But he takes those lessons of surrealism and moves away from academic techniques that he learned at the Cairo School of Fine Arts. He joins an independent group called the Contemporary Arts Group. Um, and he kind of, because of this move, he and his compatriots are very well positioned to be taken up um, by the new regime um, because they're, they're, you know, they're rejecting the academic French styles that were associated with the colonial or pseudo-colonial context, the occupation context of modern Egypt before the revolution. And so they're perfectly positioned to become the darlings of the Nasser regime. Um, here is Al-Nisak, which is glorifying one of Nasser's um, important political documents that he issues in the early 60s. And um, so here, um, this painting actually won a medal. Um, so Ghazar, somebody posted, recently on Instagram, a video clip uh, or, uh, from television of Ghazar re receiving this medal from directly from Nasser from, for paint, a paint, this painting. Um, so he, you know, this, this turn um, towards Islam, this is again, how is he using that Islamic heritage here? He's using it in order to be part of, um, part of this new political movement. So it's not necessarily because he's returning to an Islamic past, or because he's particularly religious, but because he's using a different sort of past, um, a different heritage to, to, to signal a move to a different political um, social context. Okay, so the main thesis of my book argues that Egyptian modernism was characterized by an approach that I call constellational modernism. So it was really important for me to, in this book, to not only add to the story of modernism, but to change the terms of how we talk about it. Um, and so um, I'm going to go back to Mahmoud Mokhtar to explain. So he, again, as I said, was the, one of Egypt's, he was Egypt's most famous modern sculptor. He had these two studios, one in Paris and one in Cairo. And um, he clearly traveled for his art, right? So he had two studios. He went to school in Cairo as a young man, and then he got a fellowship to study at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris in the 19 teens. So he's clearly in this transnational network in terms of his art and his production. But why, when, why I wanted to use this word constellational modernism was because it's not just where the artwork is going or where the artist is going, but that this approach is actually visualized in the aesthetics of the artwork. Um, so it's both a conceptual and a visual strategy employed by the artists. And so I was, as I was writing the book, I was like working, working out some other terms um, and the terms global and transnational, I felt really didn't fit here as the best way to explain what was going on. Global was way too broad. It implies an intense and widespread connectivity like we have in the 21st century. And that is certainly not what was going on here. There were connections, there was traveling, but not at the extent um, that we have today, certainly. Um, and transnational was too reliant on national framework. So often these artists were referencing their national identity or support um, or traveling within nationally prescripted routes, but often they broke with those as well. So transnational kind of um, didn't, didn't work as well. So constellational, if you imagine a constellation, um, it's a finite set of stars. So these artists reference a finite set of connections, very specific and, and precise, but not too many of them. Um, and then they drew, a, they drew a picture that united everything together. So it's a visual, it's a visual um, approach um, and a conceptual one. So I'll give you a ref I'll give you an example here in Mahmoud Mokhtar's Isis from 1928. So first, Mahmoud Mokhtar is clearly referencing his Egyptian identity um, and Egyptian art history through the 
iconography of the seated scribe. And this is a sculpture that he would have seen in Paris, he could have seen in Paris at the Louvre. And there's also a version at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So that way that she's sitting is clearly a reference to the seated scribe and she's Isis, which is an Egyptian goddess. Um, but he's also telling us about his training at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, where the central curricular um, approach was the study of Greco-Roman sculpture. So the way that he is using the marble, the asymmetry of her body breaks with that ancient Egyptian symmetry and seems to be more like Greco-Roman sculpture and just the kind of virtuosity of his, of his sculptural technique. You can see um, the, the kind of ripples of her ribs under her skin here is very, very clear reference to his training in Paris and his knowledge of both the Egyptian and the Greco-Roman pasts. Um, in the jewelry that she's wearing, he seems to be referencing the Egyptian revival design that was super popular in the 1920s, especially after the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Um, and perhaps also uh, referencing popular culture, Cleopatra already had entered into uh, the film and the film industry in 19, very, very early 1917, this silent film um, starring Feda Bara. So you see he's referencing, it's kind of like a, a visual map for the modern viewer to uh, untangle, to unravel um, this, uh, the, the set of references that he is telling us about his training, his knowledge, his identity, and he's leaving it, all of it there for us to untangle. Okay. So then the question that I like to leave everyone with is, is constellational modernism applicable elsewhere? Um, I definitely think it's applicable in Egypt, but is it a helpful way to think about artworks in other places, modern artworks in other places? Um, here is a battle of Adwa. Um, uh, I also talk about Wifredo Lamb and uh, Ibrahim al-Salahi and their connection to post-surrealist mystical practices of Abdul Hadi al-Ghazar. And I'm thinking that Sadia is going to tell us a little bit about Azarina Hashmi. So I'm just wondering, you know, this is the question that I leave you with. Is this a good way to think about um, modernisms in other parts of the world? And how can it help us kind of untangle um, the, the connection between colonialism and modernism? Often modernism was brought to these places through colonialism. And is there a way to um, separate those two things or are they inextricably bound? So with that, I thank you very much for listening and turn it over to Sadia. So go ahead, Sadia. Oops, sorry. I, I said thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Alex and uh, Elizabeth, for those wonderful presentations and Iftikhar for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay. Um, thank you. You know, I echo everyone else's thanks to the organizers and the team at the Sharjah Art Foundation for all of their work organizing the meeting and all of these stellar talks. And thank you to everyone who's joining us from around the world for tuning in. Some of you have woken up early to spend time with us and others of you are spending your Saturday evening with us. Um, I just wanted to say one thing about presenting at this year's March meeting because it's a particular appointment um, time for me. Uh, I studied with Okui um, when I was a fellow at the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Study Program like almost a decade ago now. Uh, and his work and methodological approach really influenced me immensely and set me on the path that has led me here today, um, having just defended my PhD thesis at Cornell, where I study with Salah and Iftikhar, um, and being able to speak to you all today. Um, just before I defended, two of the artists that were part of my work passed away, of course, Oakley passed away, uh, Zarina Appa just over a year ago now, last year in 2020, and Lala Rukh in 2017, right before my fieldwork began in Lahore, and we were meant to kind of um, sit down together. Uh, so it's an honor to be able to pay tribute to them also today through the presentation. Uh, my book project is entitled Fugitive Abstraction and it attends to the important but largely overlooked history of abstraction across post-independence South Asia during the second half of the 20th century. It focuses on a loose constellation of artists, um, oops, on whom 
uh, little scholarship exists, Zarina, Nasreen Mohammadi, and Lala Rukh, artists who identified as women and who were working across India, Pakistan, the Indian Ocean, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan from the 1960s to the 1990s. The book investigates the artist's shared approach to aesthetic form that links the traumatic partition of the Indian subcontinent with decolonization and the diasporic dislocations that resulted, foregrounding themes of migration, citizenship, and gender. What I'll be presenting today is part of this book project. Um, an excerpt, uh, it's part of this book project. It's an excerpt of an essay that will be coming out in a special issue on Asian American pasts and futures in the peer reviewed Panorama Journal of the Association of Historians of American Art, which comes out later this summer. This paper focuses, this paper and this presentation will focus on Zarina's involvement in the third world women's movement after she migrates to New York City in the mid 1970s, uh, the influence of the non-aligned movement as a political and ideological framework and the concept of feminism and translation and decolonization as it moves across multiple sites. Zarina was uh, just 10 years old when partition occurred. Um, Sorry, I'm having trouble toggling between my, okay. Oops. Zarina was uh, just 10 years old when partition occurred. Her family fled the violence engulfing the North of what was then British colonial India by traveling, um, traveling by road from Aligarh up to Delhi and then down to Karachi where they stayed with extended family. Returning home, um, sorry about that. Returning home through the then porous borders only after the killing and looting subsided. Both the visual and olfactory memory of burning bodies strewn along the roadside that Zarina passed as a child remained with the artist throughout her life, although she spoke of it very rarely, if at all. Although Aligarh was the city of her birth, Zarina's parents had migrated there from the Punjab province. The artist's father, Sheikh Abdul Rashid, was a professor of history at Aligarh Muslim University and the family lived on campus in faculty housing. Zarina's mother was in Barda, which means that she was educated by teachers within the home and that she did not work outside of it. The tradition of Barda changed after partition and Zarina was educated outside of the home in Urdu medium schools, later at Aligarh Muslim University where she studied mathematics. Zarina grew up in a multilingual context. While her father was fluent in English and Persian, her parents shared the languages of Urdu and Punjabi and raised their children speaking Urdu exclusively at home as they were wary of corrupting their accents with Punjabi intonations, which speaks to the class mobility that education then afforded families. Though the artist often recalled that her father had no interest in ever leaving India after partition, her family did end up leaving, eventually migrating to West Pakistan, then West Pakistan by the late 1950s. This left her in the not uncommon predicament of belonging to a homeland with no family left in it. In a conversation with Glenn Lowry, the artist noted, when I was traveling, I always thought that one day I would go home, but there was nothing to go back to because by then my family was scattered all over the world. After Zarina completed her undergraduate degree at AMU in 1958, she married and left Aligarh. Her husband, Saad Hashmi, was a diplomat in the Indian Foreign Service, and the young couple moved often due to his work living in cities across the world, including Bangkok, Bonn, Paris, and others. Zarina began printmaking in Bangkok where the couple first moved after marriage. After moving to Paris in the 1960s, she apprenticed with Stanley William Hayter at Atelier 17 and found herself alongside many artists from the newly independent nations of Africa and Asia who were studying in Europe on fellowships from the late 1950s to the 1970s. It's here that she met the artist Krishna Reddy and Judy Bloom Reddy, who like her would later move to New York City. Zarina separated from her husband upon, returning, uh, upon their return from Paris to Delhi in 1968. She moved alone into a Barsapi, a small one-room apartment in the neighborhood of Jangpura, where her hulking printing press doubled as a dinner table in the single room of the home. Zarina lived within walking distance of a burgeoning community of artists then in South Delhi, including Tayyib Mehta, M.F. Hussein, Krishan Khanna, Jeram Patel, and Nasreen Mohammadi, who were then still a ragtag group of artists, not yet the celebrated modernists they would become. 
Zarina created a significant body of work in Delhi, leaving again in 1974 for Tokyo, where she learned woodblock printing and apprenticed at the studio, at the studio of Toshi Yoshido before migrating the following year to the United States. While Zarina was not part of the women's movement in India, having left before it began in the 80s, she had stopped using her marital surname by then, which I read as a quiet and powerful critique of patriarchal naming conventions that rendered women as property after marriage. Zarina built out her loft and gradually built up a community in New York in the mid 1970s, where she was part of the city's burgeoning feminist uh, art movement. In 1979, Zarina was on the guest editorial staff of Third World Women, The Politics of Being Other, a special issue of Heresies, a feminist publication on art and politics that ran from 1977 through 1993. She hosted the first meeting of the guest editorial staff of Heresies special issue in her live work studio. When Zarina joined the editorial collective, she was recently widowed under extreme financial stress working freelance graphic design jobs and teaching paper making and paper casting workshops at the New York Feminist Art Institute. She was making sculptures and taking a course on editing at the New School in preparation for the special issue. The editorial group for this particular issue was entirely non-white, unlike the collective itself, which was overwhelmingly white. The guest collective included Lula May Blockton, Yvonne Flowers, Valerie Harris, Virginia Jaramillo, Don Russell, Naima Shabazz, and Zarina. The collective introduced themselves in their editorial statement saying, quote, we are painters, poets, educators, multimedia artists, students, shipbuilders, sculptors, playwrights, photographers, socialists, craftswomen, wives, mothers, and lesbians. In the beginning, we were Asian American, Black, Jamaican, Ecuadorian, Indian, in parentheses from New Delhi, and Chicana, foreign born, first generation, second generation, and here forever. We are all of these, and this is extremely difficult to define." Unquote. Zarina was the only Indian then, as well as what we would today call South, South Asian. And peculiarly, she does not mention Aligarh, the city she was born in, and which she would then return to almost obsessively in her later work from the 2000s. Her biographical section in the edition reads, quote, Zarina is an artist from India now living in New York City. She is a feminist committed to the rights of the third world, unquote. Howardina Pindell recalled the challenges faced in completing this issue and that Zarina worked doggedly on the issue at the time. The group's editorial statement also noted how much the differences of the women in the collective, in the special, um, in this guest editorial collective created fissures in the group that were too much for some who actually left, whereas other insisted on the importance of working together despite these differences, forging solidarity through the sameness of their double racial sexual oppression. This issue included essays, poetry, artwork, and interviews with contributions from Howardina Pindell, Beverly Buchanan, Lee Lan, uh, John A. Quick to see Smith, Audrey Lord, Gloria Jaramillo Trout, Joy Harjo, Anna Mendieta, and Adrian Piper, amongst many others. Zarina Blockton, Zarina Blockton and Jaramillo edited and also worked on the graphic design of the issue. And Zarina curated its, uh, a section that was called The Other Portfolio, which consisted of abstract works with paper that included Zarina's work, Wall, from 1979. Although the artist had made 2D wood relief prints in New Delhi with the same title, this was a cast paper pulp sculpture, an extruded grid of densely packed squares that seemed to emerge from a thickened ground. Although the, the, although the photograph of this work by her friend, the photographer Ram Rahman, casts a slight shadow below the sculpture at the bottom, the image fills the page and does not convey the work's scale or the way a visitor might encounter the object in space. In person, the gray wall-mounted sculpture actually resembles cast concrete, but upon closer inspection, its air pocket-like holes belie a soft fibrous materiality. It was at this time that Zarina began drawing together the work she had made in Paris, Delhi, and Tokyo with the influences of New York City's feminist, minimalist, and post-minimalist movements, evident in her experiments with cast paper pulp sculpture from the late 1970s onwards, such as this one, 
throughout the time, um, and it bears mentioning that throughout this time that she was living in the United States, Zarina continued to have solo shows at galleries in Delhi, Bombay, and Karachi, where she would travel back to quite often. The year after she worked on the Heresy's Third World Women's Issue, she took part in her first feminist exhibition at the Artists in Residence Incorporated in the exhibition Dialectics of Isolation, an exhibition of third world women artists of the United States from 1980, a show that she actually co-curated with Ana Mendieta and Kazuko Miyamoto. Air Gallery, as it was called, was the first women's cooperative gallery in the United States where the ex exhibition was mounted. Artists applied to the gallery for membership and were selected by existing members who reviewed their applications and slides of their work. Members then had to work in the gallery, pay monthly dues, and in return were given solo shows every two years. And because it was a cooperative, um, and because it was a cooperative, they did not have to split any of their sales with the gallery. The Tokyo-born born artist Kazuko Miyamoto had joined the gallery in 1974 while Ana Mendieta was accepted in 1977. Mendieta invited Zarina to apply, but her application was rejected. In an interview I had with her, she laughed when she recounted the story, saying that she suspected they thought she was an upper-class Indian because of how well she spoke English. The three friends shared their frustrations with the white feminist movement's dismissal of third world women and their invisibilization of their histories. Um, they argued that white feminism, uh, that white feminism remained oblivious to imperialism and histories of art and decolonization. Mendieta was a refugee from Cuba. Miyamoto and Zarina were recent immigrants to the United States from Japan and India, respectively. Miyamoto recalled in an interview I had with her that um, in, in an interview I had with her that Mendieta and herself were referred to as foreigners during that time, and not through the nomenclature of immigrants that is more commonly used today. While Mendieta's role in curating this exhibition is well known, Zarina and Miyamoto's contributions are often overlooked. Working together, the three friends shared the labor of the exhibition and used the platform given to them to share space and resources with other third world women who, like white women, would never have had the chance to exhibit their work in the male dominated spaces of museums and galleries. But were also excluded from. But these women were also excluded from feminist art spaces, which white women dominated. Mendieta again wrote, "Quote during during the mid to late '60s, as women in the United States politicized themselves and came together in the feminist movement with the purpose to end the domination and exploitation by white male culture, they failed to remember us. American feminism, as it stands, is basically a white middle class movement." She wrote. Mendieta had become increasingly frustrated by them with the meetings that, she, that were compulsory. She began missing them and before resigning in 1982, tried to sell her membership outright to an artist whose application had been rejected. The artist refused feeling embarrassed to join the, um, to join the gallery in that way. The artist in the exhibition Dialectics of Isolation included Judith F. Baca, Beverly Buchanan, Janet Olivia Henry, Sengen Ngudi, Lydia Okumura, Selena Whitefeather, Zarina, and Howardina Pindell. Pindell exhibited her controversial video work, Free White and 21, for the first time, and it played a central role in articulating the show's critique of white feminism. In it, Pindell plays two characters, herself, a black woman, flatly recounting stories of racial discrimination, and also as a white feminist uh, who alternates between gaslighting and threatening to erase the black woman. The video is alternately horrifying and funny, with the artist wrapping her head in a white bandage and peeling material off from her face like a second skin. Zarina exhibited her work Corners in this exhibition, which brought together her previous work with collaged wood relief prints in Delhi uh, with the influence of the minimalist and post-minimal movements she was exposed to then. Although the gray sculpture, again, looked as if it were hewn from stone, it was also made from pulped paper mixed with water, compressed in a mold. Its surface sheen was the result of mixing powdered graphite in it before casting. In the 1970s through the 1980s, third world meant many things. The term emerged in the wake of World War II uh, out of the Afro-Asian Bandung Conference during the era of decolonization. It denoted, a graphic it denoted a geographic territory as well as a temporality of capitalist development in which the third world was belated in a teleological development narrative led by the quote unquote first world. 
In the United States, it was a term used to describe non-whites, akin to the term black in Britain, which was an identity that then referred broadly to post-colonial migrants. In the catalog's one-page introduction, Mendieta states that the artists in the show share the concerns of the non-aligned nations, by which she meant the movement which was founded at the Belgrade Conference in 1961. In the United States, third world was a broader category used for a range of non-national identities and sexual orientations, including black, indigenous, Latine, Latin American, Asian, gay, and lesbian, among others. Beyond these definitions and usages, third world also denoted a third way of other futures and political imaginaries. Gayatri, uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak bemoaned the fact that the third way was not accompanied by a commensurate intellectual effort in the cultural field beyond the simple binary of nationalism or anti-imperialism. The history of third world women is largely ignored though in analyses of the failure of the non-aligned movement. And it is here that I believe dialectics of isolation should be situated, prope propelling us beyond the limits of these old binaries, as well as newer forms of majoritarian nationalism towards the creation of other collectivities and solidarities. It bears mentioning that this exhibition actually precedes shows of globalization in Western Europe in the late 1980s, while also looking at the intersection of political and ideological forces of decolonization through the exclusion of racialized groups in what we call the West. Um, the gallery, like much of the second wave white feminist art world, was made up of what Howardina Pindell calls imperial feminists. Like other white feminist organizations of the time, such as Heresies, AIR Gallery was willing to allow third world to modify woman in one show or one issue, but not to modify the mission of the organization, nor who was considered for membership or sat on its board. In the introductory text, as I mentioned, Mendieta unequivocally unequivocally stated that feminism was a white middle-class movement that failed to remember third world women. But then she does something remarkable in her writing. Mendieta turns away from the imperial gaze. The text does not go on to demand inclusion for these artists and instead exhibits a refusal to assimilate into liberal feminist politics of inclusion. This exhibition, writes Mendieta, points not necessarily to the injustice or incapacity of a society that has not been willing to include us, but more towards a personal will to continue being other. The exhibition I contend helps point us to a third way. Thank you. I'm just gonna um, try to unshare. Thank you, Sadia. Um, we can, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I'm asking the organizers if there are questions um, that we can uh, see uh, while they're posting the questions. Um, perhaps uh, let me just summarize. So this is a uh, three very rich presentations that give us very uh, kind of, they, they cover kind of large, you know, kind of issues. And uh, I'm sorry, we didn't have more time for each of the presenters to, to, to go in more depth. Um, uh, the question of, uh, and I think it also spans a, an arc that uh, that goes from the late, sort of the late 19th century into the into the late 20th century. Um, so, uh, so we have an enormous ground that we uh, we can cover. Uh, some of the things that we can discuss have to do with uh, the question of concepts and terminology. Okay, that uh, in the case of Elizabeth's uh, uh, presentation, I think the among the issues that come up have to do with uh, uh, the, the idea of decolonial aesthetics and the relation of uh, uh, of nationalism uh, uh, to that, uh, especially you know uh, exemplified uh, by the case of Ethiopia, which is was one of the few uh, non uh, formally non colonized uh, you know areas in actually almost all of Asia and Africa. Um, so um, so that is something to to kind of keep in mind. Um, also, the role of kind of social and intellectual context, and also ideology in the in the way it shapes uh, kind of artistic practice. Um, uh, for Alex, um, is a you know a focus on three artists, and um, also um, uh, the, the the 
the, the proposal she has put forward and argued for, which is uh, the idea of constellational modernism, which is a set of finite, uh, 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 you know, finite but uh, but transversal uh, network of influences and uh, and uh, touchstones that artists uh, develop their practices with. Uh, again, the question of the nation and uh, ideology and uh, and uh, their relationship to, to artistic practices uh, is also an important one for Egypt. Um, uh, and remain, it remains the case in the Nasser period as well, right? And perhaps becomes more, more important in the Nasser period. And, uh, and Sadia gives us a very different um, a view of uh, a really a practice set in a transnational uh, kind of a diaspora transnational framework, excavating the, um, you know the, the the feminist collectives that were uh, were active in in, in the eighties, um, focusing on the figure of uh, of Zarina, but really showing the the instabilities of the categories of uh, uh, that were used to describe describe them, right? And uh, and also the a kind of a recovery of the third world as a as, as a as a as a project and as a concept that helps us to think about. The, the 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 disjunctures that um, uh, artists, uh, migrants, and feminists occupied, you know, at that time, and perhaps which we still do at some in some ways uh, today. Um, so, uh, with that, let me uh, let me begin with uh, us uh, addressing some of the questions that have been posted. Um, uh, so, uh, the first question I'll uh, I'll ask is. Uh, uh, by Ayelet Zohar, can we think of decolonialism in the plural? Is the decolonization of Ethiopia from different to the decolonization of Sharjah, UAE, or India? Um, and uh, so perhaps we can begin with that. The question of how do we understand uh, this larger, uh, perhaps the question is too large for us to answer, but perhaps if each of you have a, can take a short stab at it, okay? <laughs> Uh, in terms of how you understand uh, decolonization, just in like three sentences, okay? Okay, I'll start. So the, the whole thing is for me, uh, so I'm looking at ideas. I mean, when you don't have uh, the colonial myth and ideology, when you don't have that in the framework of decolonization, what does it mean? You know, so Ethiopian, Ethiopian exceptionalism thinks of itself, as a non-colonized country, so it's not colonized. It doesn't share the, decolon the decolonization history uh, of other colonized nations. You know, so we, we're not, you know, we're in Africa, but not part of Africa type of thing. Where because Africans had been colonized, we haven't been colonized. So this imaginary, this type of imaginary, how do you see a decolonial aesthetic without? understanding the colonial myth and ideology, not only the co colonialism that happened in, in the early 1900s or before that, but the, 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 the colonial intervention at the present moment. Uh, so how do you understand decolonialism without understanding the colonial myth and ideology? That's, that's the question I wanted to raise. Uh, in, in the whole book, is an it's, it's trying to understand that, you know? So I think I'll just summarize it with that. <laughs> yeah, so the, the relation between, let's say, formal colonize or actual physical colonization and a kind of an ideology that may be broader and more pervasive and more insidious perhaps than even, you know, actual physical colonization, perhaps, huh? Okay, um, Alex, uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, so I think, for me, what's important with decolonization is decolonizing art historical methodology and how we approach modernism. Um, I think there's an ethical imperative now to change the way, not only what we talk about, but how we talk about it. Um, and so I think uh, for me in this project, um, the decol decolonizing the methodology is acknowledging the legacy of the intertwined colonial project and modern art history and my position within that um, and then striving to change the methodology with like this term constellational modernism changing the way that we talk about modernism 
um, through changing the terms, but I think also acknowledging um, that I am talking from a position uh, that has, that is embedded in that colonial legacy. I mean, just, you know, the fellowship process of the American government sending me to Egypt to do this project. Um, and I think that, that, you know, we're still, we're still grappling with, with those histories and just have, you know, the, the ethical imperative to acknowledge it and try to work against it. Um, I, I think that's a really, it's a great question and it's a very, you know, complex question as everyone's answers, like, um, Elizabeth and Alex, um, their answers, you know, give us a sense of, and I, I just, I don't know, I don't have an answer for it at all. And I think, you know, the, you know, it's, it, one has to define one's terms in a sense. And so, um, at least in, in my presentation and in the artists that I'm looking at, I'm you know, following many other scholars and doing this, but thinking about artistic prax, uh, practices as participating in a process of decolonization, you know, a creative process that's really actively contributing to an understanding and a remaking of these worlds um, from the positionality of kind of colonized subjects. I also think that, you know, the question is an interesting one because it's about moving across different regions and and you know, today we find ourselves in a context in a situation where um, empire is not only located in Western Europe and the United States. You know, and so we have to think about kind of um, you know reorganizations in the post-colonial context that render certain kind of populations uh, hegemonic and others non-hegemonic. You know, in very um, you know in in very um, you know, pressing political ways. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do or thinking about uh, is how do we, how do we kind of reconsider um, categories of region, you know, language, belonging, whether it's national, along gender, race, caste, religion, you know, nation, citizenship, et cetera, um, uh, ability, et cetera, and think about um, concepts in kind of migratory, in migratory ways. Um, and how do we do justice to that complexity actually? Um, so I think, I mean, what my paper was doing was trying to look at decolonization in this kind of multiply, um, in this kind of multiply situated way, you know, with an artist who, whose own uh, nation of origin is, you know, um, is rendering certain subjects marginalized minorities who then are persecuted, whether it's because of caste or religion, but in the United States, you know, as a migrant, she's at the center of this kind of diaspora of third world women artists in which decolonization is a very different process, practice and history. Um, so I, just to say, it's a very interesting and complex question. Um, thank you for it. Can I just add one more thing, Ustaka, or no? Yes, yes. No, so my whole thing is that, you know, this whole concept of decolonization has become, you know, pervasive in academic inquiry these days. So, but, but decolonization uh, requires the understanding of specific histories. Uh, so how do we understand uh, decolonization in history? For Ethiopia, uh, knowledge production itself is devoid of colonial myth and ideology. I mean, uh, there is a sense of exceptionalism that really takes it out from uh, the colonial histories of Africa. So, uh, so how do you understand decolonization as such a sensibility? You know, how do you have decolonization? I'm talking about contemporary artists today. Contemporary artists are uh, contesting the injustices of the state. You know, and particularly a lot of uh, artists are involved in uh, in urban urbanism and the space where you know you see flagrant um, um, violation of the urban space. You know where many people are being uh, deployed to many miles out of the city. You know, so in, desti desti in destitution, they cannot find jobs in the areas and and uh, stuff like that. So you know, artists are concerned with how the state is urbanizing, uh, with how the state's urbanization projects are. But, you know, at the end of the day, urbanization is part of uh, 
neoliberal impositions on the state, you know, which is a new colonial, a new co the new colonialities of uh, of what where we're living in, uh, what, what, how we're living in today. So if you don't understand the larger concept of neoliberalism, how do you how do, can you have a decolonial aesthetic? That's that's my question. You know, can you have a decolonial aesthetic sensibility when you don't understand? the larger implications of colonialism and its aftermath. That's what I wanted to, to bring about. Yeah, so I, I just, um, there are other questions we need to address. I just wanted to say a few things about this. One is that, of course, we, uh, you know, de in some ways, decolonization is also can be kind of a, quite an empty signifier if you don't flesh it out with kind of, you know, with content, right? And that content may depend upon the period you look at and the area you look at, et cetera. Um, and uh, generally speaking, um, the question of, uh, I mean, so, so one, one problem is the problem of, uh, let's say, formal political colonization, but also the, or, in, or, or versus the colonization of the mind, okay, <laughs> or consciousness or ideology or beliefs or, you know, worldviews, okay, so that's one, one set of issues. Uh, the second is that, uh, you know, is, let's say, colonization and westernization, the same thing as modernization. I mean, I think those kind of slippages have to be also examined more carefully, okay? And I think the third thing for us, which is, comes through in the, in the, I think in all three presentations is, the, is actually the conflicted role of the artist, right? So Elizabeth, you presented the, I mean, I think we don't need to think of artists as either heroes or villains. I think the, the project artworks and artistic Trajectories are complex careers and gambits, you know, uh, that have to be seen in, you know, in relation to the kind of intellectual, social, aesthetic uh, kind of uh, frameworks around them and how we receive them today. And I mean, among the problematic figures that come up, of course, uh, in uh, in Elizabeth are the uh, your artists who had to work under kind of Marxist ideology, right? Uh, uh, for uh, for Alex, we have a figure like Mahmoud Said, okay, where, I mean, how do you place him in relation to col colonial thinking, right, for example, right, and questions of gender and class, etc., which Alex brings up. And in Sadia's presentation, here you have a feminist project, but you have actually, you know, you have a very important body of, uh, you have a very, a small but very important uh, group of uh, of women who are, you know, who call themselves third world feminists and who actually don't agree very much with the with white feminism. So I think these are all also um, fractures, right? That, uh, um, and I think uh, some of the emphasis that Sadia brings in terms of a migratory kind of, you know, a fugitive migratory aesthetic has to be, I think, uh, I would say is a good way to think about it in relation to the more static ways of conceiving, you know, or, uh, or thinking. Um, even for earlier periods, I would argue. Okay, so I want to get to some other questions. Uh, so there, is, there are some important comments, but um, some of them are factual, um, which I won't get to, I apologize, because I think we should to, uh, um, to the conceptual aspects of this discussion. Uh, so a question by Hamad Nasser, how do you see your shared projects of expanding or intervening in the dominant narratives of modernism in conversation with the proposition to demodernize in the European Museum, I guess the question is has to do with you know with your your research and what the museum ought to do. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so again, like three sentence answers maximum. Okay. Anyone? Elizabeth, do you want to start? Not re I didn't understand the question. Uh, if the car, can you just rephrase it? You just say. Yeah. Something? So the question is, what is what should like in light of the research that all three of you are doing, you know, in, uh -huh. term, in your own areas, what should the museum do, right? In other words, what's the role of the museum or the uh, in relation to the kind of insights you're uh, developing in, with respect to the areas of research you are in, engaged in, right? Yeah. On, in terms of broadly under the umbrella of quote unquote decolonization. Okay. <laughs> if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think it's it, the question may be a bit of a provocation for all of us because I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's saying, you know, we're all doing these projects under the framework of global modernism at the time when Europe, the you know the Western European and American museums are trying to demodernize. I don't know if that's um, if the if you do you agree with? I think that's what he might be asking. 
yeah, it's not clear to me what demodernize uh, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps means. Perhaps Hamad can flesh it out. In the meantime, let's go to the next question, which is by Murtuza Wali. And he's addressing it to Sadia. Can you speak a bit about the category race, nationality, challenging uh, solidarities you outlined in your talk that were also forged by the other two artists you examined, Lala and Nasreen, which you actually didn't talk much about. So, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Murtaza, for that question. Um, so I, I'll say a little bit um, about about that. Yes. So the in terms of, I mean, race and racialization. Um, you know, for Zarina and Nasreen Mohammadi in the context of, you know, let's say race, racialization, um, nationality or gender in the, in the context of each of the three artists, kind of what like Elizabeth was saying has to be contextualized very specifically within, um, within very specific histories. So for Zarina, you know, if later in life, um, you know, she says that her generation never identified themselves by religion, but you know, in the 90s, let's say, um, whether or not her generation identified themselves by religion, um, many of them came to be identified by their religion, you know, so the question of being a kind of Muslim minority subject becomes one that one does not define for oneself, but is kind of determined hegemonically. So when I'm saying race and racialization in the context of India, um, you know, it's kind of ethno racialization, but that, um, that that is one of the, the ways that it comes up. With Lala, with Lala Rukh and uh, Nasreen Mohammadi, Mohammadi is someone who refused actually to show, wasn't a feminist, you know, it wasn't part of any of these feminist movements, but refused to show her work in women only exhibitions. And so I read that as a kind of uh, refusal of certain kind of gendered binaries and an insistence on being treated in a kind of ungendered um, uh, uh, way which Gita Kapoor actually writes about Muhammadi as ungendered and the piece she writes on an elegy for a beloved. Um, and then for Lala, the question of very quickly, um, nationalism is a very important one. You know, as you know, the women, the Women's Action Forum, um, that you may know, they were actually the only group, you know, um, the women who are from Pakistan who participated in these transnational um, women's movements and these uh, meetings and conferences that they would organize across South Asia actually uh, issued an official apology to Bangladesh for the um, for the mass rapes that were part of the during the war of liberation of Bangladesh and so I mean these are very quick examples but of the kinds of solidarities that were happening across um, you know for Lala Rukh it was like across the nations and um, you know, refuting a kind of complicated inter-colonial history um, across the subcontinent as well. There's a question for um, Elizabeth, um, which is by Salma Haddad. Uh, why were art supposed to create paintings to support a certain ideology? Was art considered a powerful medium to reach the public at that time? So in other words, why I mean, to even bother with the art students means that art had some, that, you know, there was a recognition that art had some capacity power, right? During uh, the uh, socialist regime. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Of course, it was a proper, and I, okay, I'll get to that question, but I just wanted to say for the previous question that said demodernization of museums or whatever, but from, just to give a context of, uh, what the museum is in the continent, first of all. I mean, it, in the West, it, it, it had been very difficult for artists of the global South to enter the Western platform. So the, the last 20 years has given, I mean, has gone a lot further in accepting uh, uh, artists from the global South, but still is a struggle to get it in the Western art platforms, in the Western art museums. In the, for, for people in the continent, for artists in the continent to enter the Western art platform is literally impossible. Uh, first of all, you need, uh, you need uh, the critics, you need the promoters, you need the, the curators, which is, uh, which is really, I don't want to say non-existent, but very minimal. Uh, so it, the museum space for artists in the continent is literally closed, you know, the, in the West, it's literally closed. And for us, the museums, our conditions, our context of museums in the country itself is very, uh, very problematic, you know, it's, it's, 
not too many modern art museums. Uh, if, it, if there is a museum, it's the natural history that includes Lucy, if it's Ethiopia, Lucy, the, you know, the skeleton Lucy, the, the first human being, up to modern art in one museum in, in three floors. So the whole concept of the museum itself uh, needs to be problematized. I mean, it needs to be reworked. What museum means in this country, first of all, is very contentious. So I just want to say that. For the second um, question, yes, the School of Fine Arts and Design was a, was a good place for propaganda. Uh, and, the, and the state used it effectively, particularly uh, poster art. You know, poster art artists made money out of it. At the same time, the the state used it uh, to 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 promote its different endeavors, like you know, power to the proletariat. You come out to march tomorrow, that sort of stuff. You know, it it, it was used very effectively. At the same time, you know, the, the curriculum was totally changed in 1975 to I, I, I itemize like six or seven things that artists should produce glorification of the proletariat and so on and so forth. And these, you know, artists parodied the state in some capacity, you know, they, uh, they didn't really, some of them, of course, produced and these artworks were uh, hung in ministries and, you know, given to people, dignitaries who came from the Eastern Bloc countries or the, the Soviet Union. So the School of Fine Art was effectively used for propaganda purposes for, for 17 years and which has really lingered on, I mean, that propaganda type of training and propaganda type of artistic production is still lingering on among the professors and students too. So. Um, yeah, mm, I don't know if I've answered. <laughs> so there are two questions for Alex. Uh, so the first one is by um, Mariam Altoki, who says cultural practices in Egypt have deteriorated in the past few years, comparing to artists like Mahmoud Mukhtar. Can you tell us more about this? So I, I, I'll just say that, you know, we are in the contemporary I mean, uh, we are, uh, people today are artists today are working in contemporary idioms that actually many good and strong artists from, from Egypt working in installation and other modes. So I, I think uh, to look for a sculptor like Mahmoud Mukhtar today would not necessarily be uh, what we, we may want to look for. Uh, Alex, if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, an expert in the contemporary scene right now in Egypt. I lived there in 2011, 2012, and I haven't, because of life, I haven't been able to be back too much since then. So I am not totally up to date on everything that's going on. I mean, I would say that sculpture in the 1920s is different than what it is today. And there are a lot of artists doing a lot of really interesting work across media. And that was a question I, you know, I would have for Elizabeth and Sadia just to comment um, on the materials that artists are using. I really liked um, your description, Sadia, of Zarina's um, paper pulp sculpture. Um, and I was curious, Elizabeth, about the woodcuts and some of the artworks that you showed um, from the from the um, socialist period seem to also to be kind of wood wood on wood carved on wood so uh you know i think sculpture in the expanded in the expanded field not to specifically reference rosalind kraus or anything but um for instance there's an artist that i follow on facebook uh ahmed asher and he's doing a lot of wor work with video games and game art and you know i think we can think of you know um artwork today with installation and digital and you know it's expanding there are artists maybe not working in that traditional sculptural technique but are experimenting with a lot of different kinds of media and that is happening in in Egypt um, today as well so um, no you know I think this this classical type of sculpture that Mokhtar did is not is not as prevalent today but um, I think a lot of artists are doing work in the digital sphere which I think we can see in this extension of experimenting with different sorts of media so yeah. Uh, so we have actually 10 more minutes that the organizers have graciously accorded us so we can field some more questions and have a more, more of a discussion. There's another important uh, question by Ming Tiampo um, who says uh, is the notion of constellational modernism intended to address world-making practices of individual artists or to create larger architectures of art history? If the latter, how do you imagine negotiating between multiple constellations? 
Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Is the notion of constellational modernism intended to address world-making practices of individual artists? So in other words, as every artist have their own constellation, right? Their own private constellation, okay? Yeah. <laughs> or, or, is, or, or are there larger, or is it to create larger architectures of art history? And if it's the latter, if it's the larger project, how do you imagine negotiating between multiple constellations? Um, that's, that's a really great question. And, um, and I think it's, it's both. And I think that this idea of the constellation, I think it's very flexible and indeed, you know, at the kind of granular, granular level of the individual artworks, um, it is about the individual artists making these visual connections in their work. However, you know, the, I think the benefit of the conceptual idea here of a constellation is that you can very easily build it out to the, the city level, the regional level, the international level. And so, yes, I, I would hope, I think for the book, it's about the individual, but it's proposing that we could use this framework for seeing um, these large, as you put it very nicely, thank you, larger architectures of art history building out to other other realms and you know one important thing about the constellation is that it flattens the relationships it's not talking about a center and periphery it's talking about a you know connection of finite um of finite spots and spaces and so i think you could build it out to the to the to the larger level of architectures of art history so that um yeah that that's the goal but i feel like that's the next step so thank you for that so, um, so just uh, pushing, uh, pushing on that a little bit. I think you know, I, I think uh, you know, all all of us who are involved in thinking about kind of modern and contemporary art ought to coin new concepts, and that's something that's generative, you know. Um, and I think uh, Sadia has also offered uh, fugitive abstraction, for example, and. Uh, um, I think it's also one of the things that I'm myself always caught between is to, is to offer a specific specified concept, but also to all, uh, claim the, the more general concept. So in other words, one may also equally claim modernism is already constellational, right? Or abstraction is already fugitive. It incorporates already those aspects within it too. So what, did, so what, the, what, what do we gain by making a specific, uh, to, 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 to create a specific or to identify a specific valence within it, which I think we should do because it helps us to identify and mark out certain practices in more, uh, with more clarity. Um, but it's always this negotiation between the general and the more specified, you know, kind of concept. And in the case of constellation, I mean, I would say you're saying finite, but I would also argue, does it really remain finite, right? In the sense, uh, what you get in a constellation is a spatial map does incorporate time or temporality. So when, it, when for example, if you look at, uh, the Mahmoud Nukhtar statue, one of the things you also see is Art Deco, right? And you also see Egyptomania, right? And so you get into the longer histories of kind of already the longer history since the time of Napoleon of the kind of the relationships between Egyptomania and, and the development of European art, you know? So, so in other words, does the idea of constellation also is able to take into account the temporal dimensions of, uh, you know, um, so, 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 so that that would be one uh, question for you, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, so temporal. I had never, I've never thought about it in that way, and I think definitely with this term, I it's specific to the temporal period um, of modernism, which is which I define in the book is roughly from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century because of the limits of communication and travel at that time don't allow for, you know, it's, it's a finite and a specific set of connections because of the limits of technology at the time. And I, I don't think constellational can be applied um, in, or in the same way in our contemporary world today. I think that 
it's not as finite today. I think the connections are much broader, much more frequent. Um, the, the rate of exchange has uh, really increased exponentially. Um, so temporally, I yeah, I don't know. I don't know how exactly it would. Um, I think it define it defines the modern period, and I think it's the connect the pairing with modernism is really important and I, I think that it's specific to that to this temporal um moment um and but i have to think further about how how the temporal within this the conceptual framework of the constellation how time how time would in, impacts that so thank you uh, other thoughts uh sadia or uh, elizabeth on concepts, terminology. I mean, I was thinking about the question from before, I think um, the, like the term about demodernization and our, you know, all of our different projects. Um, and I think it's a kind of interesting question and it's a challenging question. Um, and I mean, what I'm thinking is that the history that I'm trying to kind of, you know, excavate in a way of the third world women's movement. Oops, whoops, sorry, my computer. Um, the third world women's movement um, and the non-aligned movement and the era of decolonization. Um, you know, when when you, you look at someone like Zarina whose practice shifts, you know, um, as she moves from, you know, to different sites and you also look at um, you know, the kind of, Elizabeth was calling the new colonial situations, right, in these countries after independence. Um, I think it's just a good question. It's something I'm thinking about, you know, about Zarina's relationship to modernism across South Asia um, and, and how, um, and also I think, you know, modernism's relation to questions of nationalism, you know, and decolonization. I think it's, um, it is something I'm thinking about. Um, and how do we, you know, particularly in sites, you know, or subjects from the formerly colonized kind of subjects, or how, how do we think about maybe not replicating the same kind of teleologies, right, as uh, of imperial teleologies, and how can we um, approach it like if the harrier question for Alex, you know, about this kind of question of temporality, because the temporality of modernism is quite different depending on you know, which context it finds itself in. And it's possible that many things, many movements are happening synchronously in the temporality, in the post-independence temporality, which is synchronous with the post-war. Um, I just, these are just open thoughts, but I, I'd be interested to hear also what Alex and uh, Elizabeth, um, how they would feel the question. So unfortunately, I received a note from the organizers saying that we need to end. <laughs> okay, so uh, so I uh, I apologize that we don't have more time to extend our discussion. I wanted to thank uh, Elizabeth, Alex, Sadia for your uh, insightful presentations. Uh, thank you to the audience for your uh, for your great questions and. Uh, uh, and uh, we have to end here, but please, uh, please tune in for the other sessions of the March meetings that continue today and tomorrow. Uh, thank you and goodbye.